Most of you know me, but I'm Michael Kerrigan with the Community Alliance of Lane County and Cal. We are the co-sponsors of this event with the Lane Community College Peace Center. And Stan and I are going to be kind of uh, doing the intro uh, uh, together here tonight. It's an honor to have uh, Phyllis Bennett speaking. It was about 10 years ago when we brought her to town uh, for a live uh, pre presentation. She did a wonderful job at the event. We're in for a real treat tonight with her speaking to us. And of course, we've joined the 21st century with live stream. So uh, that's something new and exciting for Calc. My friend, uh, Stan Taylor, will uh, kind of tell us more about the event and welcome our speaker. So we're gonna try to move things along pretty crisply here tonight. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to start with a talk from Phyllis Bennis that will be about 45 minutes long. And when that talk ends, then my co-facilitator and I, that is um, Jane Kramer from the University of Oregon Political Science Department, will ask questions of her. And then after we've asked some questions, we'll open the floor to questions from the floor. But we have to uh, remember that we need to do this in a crisp manner because Phyllis is in Washington, D.C., <laughs> and it's three hours later in her time frame. So uh, it's pretty late for her to begin with. So it's a real pleasure to be able to introduce Phyllis Bennis. She's a fellow at the Institute for Policy Studies in Washington, D.C., and directs the, their national or the New Internationalism Program. She's also a fellow at the Transnational Institute in Amsterdam. She's been a writer, an analyst, and an activist on Middle East and UN issues for many years. She's an author of eight different books. Uh, the ones that have attracted me over the years are her primers. She has a primer on Palestine and Israel, another on ending the war with Iraq, one on understanding the Iran crisis, and yet another on ending the US war with Afghanistan. So if you want uh, information that will give you direct insight on those issues, these are books to go check out. And on top of all this work, she is uh, regularly writing and publishing in different publications. Some of her recent articles are talking points on the State of the Union of War in the Middle East, and most relevant to our discussion tonight, the rise of diplomacy, not military force, in U.S. foreign policy. Phyllis Bennis. This use of technology is a whole new thing, I've got to say. And it's great to be with you. I'd really like to thank Calc and the Peace Center and all of the other organizations involved. Uh, and all of you for coming out this night. I understand that you're not coming out at 10 o'clock at night. Uh, but nonetheless, you've come out to talk about the, the need for diplomacy and peace instead of war, and that's important. So thank you for that. This is an amazing period that we're, that we're talking in. This is a moment when the, the crisis in Ukraine, the crisis with Russia is raising all kinds of fears about a return to the Cold War, uh, the, the role of the United States in the world, the, the need for methods of using diplomacy, using alternatives to war as a way of dealing with the crises in the world. So it's exactly the right time to be talking about all of this. Uh, you know, we, we heard recently from President Obama in his State of the Union speech, he's an amazing speaker, I gotta say. Whatever else you say about him, and I say a lot, as we all do, uh, he is an amazing speaker. And he said something in that speech that was quite extraordinary. He said, America must move off a permanent war footing. And I thought, wow, you know, it was a wow moment. But then somehow it wasn't such a wow moment because the wow part needed to be not just, you know, what are, what are we saying about, uh, uh, about the idea of saying that we have to get off a war footing, but how are we gonna make that happen? What are we gonna do to change it? And that's what we didn't hear. So we're dealing with a reality where President Obama's <coughs> political base uh, mainly wants to see an end to U.S. wars, certainly wants to see an end to the war in Afghanistan, wants to stop the drone war, wants to close Guantanamo, wants to negotiate instead of war. 
exactly what Kelk is saying is is the the action for tonight, calling on members of Congress in this case, not to interfere with diplomacy around Iran. This is part of a, a very careful calculation in the White House, triangulating a kind of center left position on a number of domestic issues, not all of them, but some, and linking that with a very right wing focus on the foreign and defense policies that, that we have all been protesting for so long. But again, if you go back to the State of the Union, there were some amazing things. We had President Obama talking about Iran and saying Iran, and this was in direct answer to those who are calling for war with Iran, saying Iran is not crazy. The Iranian leadership is not crazy. And he said, and I'll quote here, if you look at Iranian behavior, they are strategic and they're not impulsive. They have a worldview and they see their interests and they respond to costs and benefits. And that isn't to say they're not a theocracy that embraces all kinds of ideas that I, President Obama, find abhorrent, but they're not North Korea, which I, I guess he does see as uh, not strategic, impulsive, etc. He goes on to say about Iran, they are a large and powerful country that sees itself as an important player on the world stage, and I do not think they have a suicide wish. They can respond to incentives. A very pragmatic, kind of realist approach to what diplomacy with Iran could look like. The problem that we face, of course, is that the views of President Obama, or even the views of the administration as a whole, are not the only decision-making factors in Washington. All of you know this very well, that there's a bunch of different forces at work in crafting what U.S. policies are going to look like. So you have the military, which in this case, interestingly, and it's been true for a while, the military brass itself is not generally pushing for expanding to new wars. They want to uh, figure out a way they can end the war in Afghanistan without ending it because they think that if we end it, in fact, we're going to lose what they consider accomplishments. Now, many of us would say we could very well stand to lose those, quote, accomplishments because they, those accomplishments have killed far too many Afghans and way too many U.S. soldiers as well. But the military is not generally out there pushing for new wars. However, the military producers, the corporations that produce military equipment, that produce weapon systems, bombers, bombs, planes, etc., they do want more wars. They do want to sell more of those products that are used only in times of war. And if there's no war, nobody's going to buy their bombs. That's a serious problem for them. So they are pushing for more war. Then you have the, the neoconservatives, based not so much in the government these days, although there's plenty of them in the Congress, but they're in think tanks, they're in the, the Washington Post editorial page, they're all over the place writing and speaking, they are constantly pushing for more war. They want the U.S. empire to be strengthened. And then you have organizations like APAC, the American-Israel Public Affairs Committee, one of the leading forces pushing for war in Iran. They want the U.S. with Israel as a, as a key partner to, to remain an even stronger version of a superpower global policeman in the Middle East, certainly, in the world as a whole. So they're pushing for war. So you have these very powerful, wealthy forces with a lot of money to throw around, a lot of access to the editorial pages, to television news, to everywhere you look, you see this kind of mainstream coverage, pushing for war, pushing for war, the inevitability of war, the desirability of war. And it becomes a, a, a real question of how to push away, how to push back against that drive towards war. One of the links that you see between those that are driving for war and the more official positions in the White House, elsewhere in Washington, that are pushing back against that, not necessarily from our vantage point, is the question of American exceptionalism. A lot of people on a lot of different sides of this issue of war versus diplomacy can unite around the idea that the United States is a somehow exceptional country. Yeah. Now, I happen to agree. I think it's exceptional in a whole bunch of ways. 
I don't think I have exactly the same definition of exceptionalism as some of these other people. I think it's exceptional in that from the beginning, our country it was grounded in a legacy of slavery, racism, and the slaughter of native people. That's what created the, the wealth and power of this country. But the other side of it, as we learned so powerfully from Howard Zinn, is that this country from its origins always had another history as well. And that was the history of the movements against slavery and the slaughter of native people. The movements against genocide, against slavery, against uh, all of the, the, the problems that have been part of this country's history. And I think it's up to us to continue our work of claiming and reclaiming those movements as much as we continue our obligation to remind ourselves and, and our children of the real legacy of what our country was grounded in. So if we look at what the, the, the policies are that we're talking about, we're looking at the drone war being expanded. Now, if we look back again at the, at the State of the Union address, President Obama said that he would impose what he called prudent limitations on the drone war. Now, that's his signature war. This is the one that he's been pushing. This isn't the one that he said he would end like Iraq or that he would wind down like he's claiming about Afghanistan. His signature war, the drone war, he's expanding it. He even said, and again in his speech, he said, we will not be safer if people abroad believe that we strike within their countries without regard for the consequence. But the problem is we're not safer because we do strike in other countries without regard for the consequence. The number of civilians being killed by U.S. drone strikes has been escalated dramatically in these last three or four years. The only prudent approach to the drone war should be to ending it not tweaking it, not saying, well, we'll do it better, we'll do it with prudent limitations, we'll debate in our Tuesday kill meetings. Can you imagine they actually talk this way? They have Tuesday kill meetings every Tuesday morning at 11 in the White House, where they go through the list, who is on the kill or capture list this week, and if there are American citizens on it, there's not, got to be a special debate about, is it really okay for us to target this person without any kind of judicial oversight because somebody said that he, it's so far it's all been men, that, that he's involved with some terrorist organization by maybe making a, a YouTube video, that gives us the right to target him. And if 30 other people get killed by mistake, well, that we don't have to worry about. That's just collateral damage. This is the meeting that goes on every Tuesday. So the question of the drone war is very much a central component of what we're, uh, what, we're, what we're dealing with right now. The question of U.S. bases around the world and the cost that they, uh, that they take, not only in, in the billions of dollars of our tax money that it goes to, to pay for them, but the environmental costs, the social costs in all the countries where these, where these bases, it's over 800 bases scattered around the world at enormous cost, destroying the environment, destroying water sources, creating huge social problems, problems of, of rape, problems of violence, problems of lack of accountability. Th these are huge problems. They're also a huge economic problem. But we're not hearing, we didn't hear it in the State of the Union address, we don't hear it in Congress, that the only way to get that money available for important social programs at home is to close down those bases around the world that once again are not making us safer and certainly are not making people in Diego Garcia safer, or not making people in any other places around the world safer. So these plans for giant uh, cuts are simply not being made real. We need giant cuts in the military budget, giant cuts in the bases, giant cuts in, the, in these huge weapon systems that are designed to fight two wars ago. Uh, even assuming that, that we thought they were legitimate, which we don't, they don't even work for the kinds of wars they think they're going to fight. Ending the wars would be the best thing for our economy that we could, we could ever imagine. But we're not hearing enough of this debate. When it comes to Iran, we're hearing the debate about why we need to think about going to war. 
the White House constantly is sounding defensive. Now, so far, the White House has pushed back. They've pushed back against those in Congress, and they've pushed back against APAC, who are calling for war. The White House, in fact, recently, President Obama uh, said explicitly, if Congress sends me a new sanctions bill that threatens to derail the talks with Iran, I will veto it. That was very important. And, and three of the 49 members of the Senate who had signed on early on to this war, not diplomacy position, uh, have pulled back. But we can't afford to stand on our laurels and say, well, we got rid of that threat. The threat remains. The threat that there could be a dis an undermining of diplomacy so profound that they would go to war is still very much a real threat. It's not something that we can afford to 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 stand back. They're they're losing so far. APEC is losing. Bibi Netanyahu, the Israeli uh, uh, prime minister, when he was here this weekend at the APEC convention, a good third of his speech was about Iran. And he was pushing hard. He was pushing back against the U.S. position uh, on Iran about sanctions. He was demanding new sanctions, tougher sanctions. And essentially, he was demanding war. He was demanding that the U.S. either go to war itself or back up Israel if Israel decides to go to war. Now, again, so far, APAC has failed to gain the kind of support they need. And this is a broader failure. APAC is losing support in a whole bunch of ways. It's still a major threat, but it is losing support relative to the kind of support it once had. But we have to be very careful. When the White House called out though, and, he, and said, those who would prefer war to diplomacy, they were talking about members of Congress, Democrats and Republicans, and they were talking about APAC. And that pushback is important. That pushback was made possible by the fact that APAC has lost a lot of its power among the public. That's because of our work, the work of all of our movements, the work of, in our movements to oppose the Israeli occupation and Israeli apartheid policies. All of that has weakened APAC's ability to stand up and threaten members of Congress as they have traditionally for so long. APAC also lost on Syria. This was huge. They were trying incredibly hard over the summer to get that commitment by the, the U.S. administration to use military force to send missile strikes against Syria. And they lost. They lost because Congress backed off because the calls, the emails, the petitions were running 900 to 1 in some cases, 600 to 5 in other cases. It was running massively against military force in Syria. People across this country were mobilizing and saying, no, we don't want a third war in the Middle East. We can't afford it. It's not going to make us safer. It's not going to protect uh, Syrians. It's not going to do any of the good things that some people claim, that that's a lie. And Congress got enough pressure that they backed away when the Obama administration had responded to the shift in international opinion and realized they were going to go it alone, the parliament in, in, in the UK first said no, they came back to Obama. Obama said, oh boy, we're going to be stuck on this one. Let's throw it over to Congress. And Congress said no because the American people said no. And APAC lost. That's huge. It's not the first time. APAC has lost before when they've tried to get something that was so clearly opposed by, by powerful forces in, in Washington, like selling arms to Saudi Arabia in 1981 in the famous AWACS case. APAC was against it. They lost. Why? Because there was an even more powerful element. In that case, it was the, the military industrial complex that wanted to build those planes and sell them to Saudi Arabia. <clears throat> this time around, it wasn't somebody who wanted to sell more planes. This time around, it was us. It was the peace movement. There was also, we have to admit, there was a right-wing movement that didn't want to go to war in Syria for a bunch of pretty crummy racist reasons. But more important than that, there was a peace movement that rose up and said, no, we're not going to stand back and say, well, you know, we can't do much here. We did it. We managed to prevent those missile strikes in Syria. We were not able 
to get the alternatives that we were demanding that would have helped to begin the process, the long and difficult process that still lies ahead of ending the war in Syria. This is a huge challenge. And when we talk about the challenge between war and diplomacy, one of the things that we have to be very careful about is that it isn't enough ever to only say, we can't have missile strikes. We can't have US direct involvement. That's always a first step, but it's very rarely a sufficient step. It wasn't in Syria, and we had alternatives. We proposed alternatives that involved preventing the, the continuation of, of arming both sides, that we needed an arms embargo, more support for the humanitarian efforts of the UN and others, a whole host of things. We didn't succeed on that, but we did succeed in preventing the escalation of the war that would have been devastating for Syrians. Would The idea that, that escalating the war, sending more bombers, more bombs to fall on more Syrians, that that somehow was going to be seen as a victory, we managed to stop that, to reverse it. And that becomes, I think, very, very important. Now, on the Iran question, we are now in the middle of this six-month period where we have this negotiating process underway. And the key thing here is to prevent the undermining of that diplomacy by those who want to destroy it, by those who want to make sure it doesn't work, by imposing new sanctions while the, or while the diplomacy is underway despite the fact that the diplomacy was based on a commitment that there would not be new sanctions during this six-month period. Obama said just yesterday, or day before yesterday, he said he admitted 95% of the sanctions, these crippling sanctions that have almost destroyed the Iranian economy with, with uh, uh, the, the value of the real diminished to almost nothing, people really hurting. Not the government so much, but people really hurting. Despite all that, 95% of those sanctions remain in place. Only 5% of the sanctions did they agree to lift during this six-month period. And yet, the hardcore opponents of, these, uh, of, of this diplomacy, you know, led by the Democratic Senator Robert Menendez, they are still committed to war over diplomacy. AIPAC finally gave them political cover to pull back. AIPAC wrote a letter saying, we're not calling for new sanctions now. And then Menendez pulled back and said, oh, well, we're not calling for new sanctions right now. But they haven't given up. The pressure remains. And so our pressure has to remain. The campaign that CALC is doing tonight is exactly what's needed. It's crucially important that we have petitions and call-in days and protests, demonstrations in the streets, in the suites, everywhere we can get to say, don't undermine the diplomacy. We want diplomacy and not war. That's how we're going to prevent a war with Iran. That's how we're going to diminish the threat of nuclear weapons. It's how we're going to legitimize the need, as we know, for a weapons of mass destruction free zone throughout the Middle East that needs to start with the one existing nuclear weapons system that does exist in the Middle East. And it's not in Iran, it's in Israel. Israel, we know, has between two and 400 high-density nuclear, nuclear bombs, not under any international inspection. We don't know what a danger they are just lying in the ground. Are they leaching radioactive poisons out into either Israeli or Palestinian water sources? More likely Palestinian, because that's where Israel gets most of its stolen water. We need a global nuclear free zone, starting with our own nuclear arsenal. But we could start with a regional one in the Middle East. It wouldn't be a bad place to start. And to do that, we need to maintain the focus on diplomacy rather than war. There are now 70 members, more than 70 members of the House of Representatives who have signed a letter supporting the Iran agreement, opposing new sanctions. All of that could collapse. President Obama's threat to veto the new sanctions if they're imposed. That could collapse. The, the pullback of, of the Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid, who said he wouldn't put it on the table, that could collapse. Apex pulling back, that could collapse if we stop our pressure. That's what it means for us to fight for diplomacy and against war. As we look at the decline of Apex, 
We also look at the other side of what APAC has always fought about. And that is the question of the Israeli occupation of Palestine and Israel's apartheid policies, both in the occupied territories inside Israel and in relation to Palestinian refugees in the region and around the world. The question of the weakening of APAC isn't just about APAC. And it's probably not even most importantly about APAC. As, as influential and as significant as APAC is as a lobby, what's much more important is how the discourse across this country has been changing to favor diplomacy and disfavor war, occupation, militarism. The discourse shift is huge. A big part of that has been the boycott, divestment, sanctions uh, movement that was created in 2005 by Palestinian civil society, but is a global movement calling for nonviolent economic pressure on Israel to stop Israel from its current level of uh, human rights and international law violations, right? So BDS has had a huge impact in changing public opinion in the United States. The campaign by the U.S. campaign to end the Israeli occupation and many others, the U.S. campaign is a coalition of more than 400 organizations around the country. Jewish Voice for Peace, the Presbyterian Church, the Methodist, huge organizations around the country that have come together to challenge U.S. military aid to Israel, to support the BDS movement, and the impact, not only of the U.S. campaign's work, but of a huge number of organizations and people and across the country, the shift in this discourse is entirely different than it was just a few years ago. You know, we're seeing a whole different, uh, a whole different way of people talking about Israel. It's no longer just Israel is our friend, Israel is our best ally in the Middle East, Israel is the only democracy. No, now we're hearing about Israeli settlement expansion. We're hearing, hearing about the apartheid wall. We're hearing about Israeli soldiers killing Palestinian kids. It's not all we hear about, but we hear a lot more of that than we ever did before. And that's huge, that's huge. In, in Europe, of course, BDS is already having an even bigger impact because it's having an immediate economic impact on Israel, even beyond the, the discourse shift that we're seeing here in the United States. Just in the last few weeks, we've seen the, the largest pension fund uh, um, in, in the Netherlands has just announced that they're severing ties with five Israeli banks because those banks are involved with illegal occupation, with building settlements. In Denmark, the largest Danish bank is blacklisting the largest Israeli bank, uh, Bank uh, Hapa Olim, for the same reason. In Luxembourg, the government pension fund is boycotting Israeli companies because those companies are investing in, in the occupied territories. In Norway, the state investment company is boycotting Israeli construction companies who are building in, in the West Bank. I mean, this is huge. This has never happened before. Here in the United States, the academic boycott, the, the decision by the, the American Studies Association, following earlier decisions by the Asian American Studies Association and the Native American Studies Association, to boycott very carefully drawn decisions to boycott Israeli institutions that are linked to the government and the occupation. This is huge. This is a whole new way of thinking about what citizens can do to support diplomacy and oppose war and occupation. And the effect of it has been enormous. We're seeing this new access to mainstream media. The New York Times running this piece by uh, Avi Schleim called uh, Israel Needs to Learn Some Manners that was exposing Kerry's so-called peace talks initiative as a what he called a clever American device for wasting time. Yes. The next day, uh, Omar Barghouti, one of the founders of the BDS movement, had a piece again in the New York Times, Why Israel Fears the Boycott. The Washington Post weighed in. They had Vijay Prasad, a caution to Israel that was defending the, the American Studies Association's decision to, to boycott. And the Post, in their own editorial, talked about how talk of a boycott is now in the mainstream. Those of us who have worked on these issues for many years, we are not on the fringe anymore. We are right smack front and center in the mainstream of public debate in this country, in the Jewish community, in the U.S. community as a whole. It's a huge shift, and it's an incredibly exciting moment. Now, that doesn't mean, and this is the big challenge for all of us, 
a shift in discourse. We saw this on Iraq. We are seeing it now on Afghanistan, and we're seeing it profoundly on Palestine, Israel. A shift in discourse is not enough to change U.S. policy. Why? Because our democracy is broken. Our democracy is too flawed to respond directly to public opinion. But public opinion is an important force. It's not enough, but we can't change policy without it. So the work that we do to change public opinion is a crucial first step. That means that we have to really understand what are they proposing. The new Kerry peace talks that are underway. I've been calling them the, the Einstein version of the talks because Einstein, some of you will remember, Einstein gave this great definition of insanity. <laughs> Sanity, he said, is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. Thank you, John Kerry. You're very smart. You're just like Einstein. He's doing what Einstein said was crazy, doing the same thing, the same peace talks over and over again and thinking the result is going to be different. So what do we know about the peace talks? It's going to require the Palestinians to recognize Israel as a, quote, Jewish state. Oh, that's going to do a lot of good for the 20% of Israeli citizens who are not Jewish, who happen to be Palestinians. It's going to in make, make it real, make it legal, make it official that they are second-class citizens. They're going to, quote, solve the refugee crisis by allowing a, quote, return of Palestinian refugees, not to their homes, as guaranteed by international law and UN Resolution 194, but, quote, return to this new Palestinian state within some borders that we don't know what they're going to be, uh, that will be allowed to go there, maybe some of them. That there will be permanent Israeli control, probably through actual annexation, of the, the, the huge city-sized settlement blocks that include about 80% of the 650,000 illegal Israeli settlers. They will simply become part of Israel in the new borders. There will be permanent Israeli control of the borders, entry, exit, the airspace. Palestine will be surrounded by and controlled by Israel. There will be permanent or near permanent Israeli military control in the Jordan Valley. Maybe they would allow U.S. troops or perhaps even Jordanian troops to join them, but Israel will remain. And those Israeli forces will be allowed the right of, quote, hot pursuit into Israeli territory. Now, there is a saving grace. Both sides, the Israelis and the Palestinians, made sure that when they agreed to start this round of talks, that they were going to allow themselves to be basing their final decision on a public referendum. Well, we can be pretty sure that the referendum isn't going to pass in either case. And beyond that, the U.S. has announced that both sides could sign on to this so-called framework agreement with reservations. Meaning, if we, if we know the history, the Palestinians will sign on to it as it is, and the Israelis will sign it and say, but we reserve our reservations on numbers one through 10 of all of it. So we're not bound by any of it. We're just going to sign so that we can go to the ceremony, because we like to sign things on the White House lawn. So that's, that's what we're, we're talking about. It's not likely to happen. But there are three possibilities, and we have to be prepared for all of them. One is that they will ask for an extension for another year. That's a very likely one. Two, that the talks will simply collapse. That's certainly likely as well. And third, that there will be something that will be created that will be called a framework agreement, an arrangement, an interim, something that will allow them to claim a victory because this is really all about victories to be claimed. This isn't about ending occupation, Palestinian self-determination, the right of return. It's not about those things. It's about claiming a legacy. Obama wants a legacy. Kerry wants a legacy. The problem is Bibi Netanyahu wants a legacy, and his legacy is the one that right now is underway on the ground. The danger here, and it's a very serious one, is that if our work goes well and we manage to get a continuation of the focus on diplomacy rather than war in Iran, a continuing refusal to further militarize the US, a U.S. presence in Syria, 
that the price that could be paid for all of that may be paid in Palestinian rights. We've seen it before. In 2004, President Bush signed a series of letters with then Prime Minister Ariel Sharon, in which Bush essentially said to Sharon, you can have the settlement blocks. They can be part of a future Israeli state. And oh, by the way, there will be no right of return, as if it was his right to give away. And after that, Sharon claimed it as his own. That's the danger here, that if we win on Iran and we win on Syria, that the price to be paid may be paid in Palestinian rights. And we have to be very conscious about that. We're seeing right now in Gaza an escalation of the imprisonment of the 1.8 people, 1.8 million people in Gaza who have been living in an open air prison since at least 2006. The one exit that they had through, through the Rafah crossing to Egypt has now been closed since the coup in Egypt last summer. The US is still backing the, the military government in Egypt. And as we saw in what happened in the last two days with the US and French and other international peace delegates who arrived in Cairo to cross at Rafah to go into Gaza for International Women's Day. You all know, I think, what happened to Medea Benjamin, who was part of that delegation, was roughed up so badly at the airport when they were deporting her that they dislocated her shoulder. The result of all of that is that the people of Gaza are more isolated, more imprisoned, more pressured than ever before. It's, it's disastrous, the, the, the impact of this. Gaza is now completely closed off. So as we look at this moment, and I, I want to, um, to, to finish up in the next few minutes so that we have time for, for discussion and questions, this question of war and diplomacy, of course, is very much on the front burner because of <clears throat> the new challenges going on regarding Russia and the Ukraine. But we're still facing this same problem of the intersection of war and diplomacy and which one gets chosen. We prevented the Syrian escalation, the, prevented the US missile strikes with massive public opposition. It was focused. It was very broad. It had both an inside and an outside strategy. It was targeted very directly on Congress. It linked with international movements. And it worked. It, we won that battle. We didn't yet win the alternatives that we needed a, the Geneva Two talks, plus we needed an arms embargo, plus we needed to stop selling arms to all sides, plus we needed more money to the humanitarian, uh, uh, the humanitarian campaigns to deal with, with uh, Syrian refugees and others. We didn't deal with the international law, human rights, UN-based alternatives successfully enough, but we got through the first important part of that process, which was preventing the escalation of US missile strikes. We shifted that discourse away from greater war. We're seeing that now. I mean, if you look, if you talk to Americans about the war in Iraq, 52% now say that war failed. 68% say it should never have been fought in the first place. More than 52% say the Afghanistan war was not worth fighting. And two thirds of the people in this country say that it failed in any of the goals that were ever claimed, uh, that were ever claimed for it. So this is, you know, this is very much the, the scenario that we're now working on. The economic crisis has been part of the reason for this. The lies that led us to war in Iraq was part of what led us into it. The social and political consequences, the failure of those wars to make life better for Iraqis, for Afghans. All of these factors played a role in discrediting war as a legitimate option in the United States. Now we're looking at the question of the withdrawal from Afghanistan. The White House is saying, well, we'd like to leave troops there, but not too many, maybe only about 3,000, and only if we can get the Afghan government to give us full immunity for those troops. That's why they pulled out of Iraq. It wasn't because President Obama wanted a full withdrawal. It was because the Iraqi parliament refused to allow the Iraqi president to sign off on immunity for U.S. troops. They said, we'd had enough of U.S. troops with immunity for killing our people for 10 years. We don't need that anymore. The result was a full withdrawal. We're about to see a very similar result 
in Afghanistan. <clears throat> and if the Afghans force the U.S. hand, that will be our victory as well to get the troops out. Again, that's not the end of our obligations. But we can't look at our obligations as internationalists, our obligations for reparations, for compensation, for all of those things, until we have an end to occupation. That's step one. It's not step last, but it's the necessary step one. The key to escalating our opposition to war is that we have to include the alternatives. We have to focus on diplomacy. What would diplomacy look like? Who is to be involved? We have to fight against this right claimed by the U.S. to determine who's on the other side. The U.S. says, well, we're not going to let Iran come to the peace talks. Well, that's a guarantee for the peace talks to fail. You know, this was a lesson of former Senator George Mitchell when he was involved in helping to lead the Good Friday process that led to the Good Friday Accord in Northern Ireland. And he said the lesson we take home from that is that if you're serious about diplomacy, everybody has to be at the table. And you can't exclude somebody because you think they're terrorists or you don't like them. The same is true for Iran. If Iran is excluded from peace talks on Syria, you can kiss them goodbye. You might as well not even bother. It would be as if the U.S. wasn't at the table. The U.S. is part of one side. If they're not there, there's not going to be serious peace talks. So that's one of our obligations, to fight for inclusive diplomacy, to fight for civil society, for women to be included in the diplomacy. We've got to make the diplomacy real. We've got to include those alternatives. We've got to change the discourse. Then we take up the even harder challenge, as hard as it is to change the discourse on war or occupation, that's going to be a picnic compared to what it takes to transform discourse shift into a real policy shift, to build a country in this country that is grounded first on those movements against genocide, against slavery, the movements that we learn about in Howard Zinn's People's History, to reclaim a people's history in this country. That's what it's going to take to replace wars with diplomacy. It's going to take all of our work. We can't ever afford to stand down. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Jane Kramer from the University of Oregon Political Science Department. <clears throat> and Stan is giving me the generous offer of getting the first question for Phyllis tonight. And I want to just say thank you very much. I learned a lot. And I can't say I disagree in any meaningful way. I really, really value everything you said. I loved it that you spelled out the different forces at work making the democracy deficit. You refer to the military, the corporations, the neoconservatives, and especially APAC. One point I want to just ask you about is you alluded to something I thought was going along on for a long time. And what I don't, what I would push you on is just to say, I think Bibi Netanyahu doesn't really want war with Iran. I think he is using the threat from Iran the way we use threats to distract the public, do threat inflation, justify his regime, and as you said, deny Palestinian rights. It's look over here while I do what I want over here. And I just want to see if you agree with that, want to fill that in. But I think he, he, he says he's going to go to war and pretends like the U.S. is restraining him. I don't think he wants war. I don't think he wants the U.S. to go to war. He acts like he does, but it's not in his interests. If you look at what his interests are, it's get the Palestinians and no war with Iran. Do you agree? I do mostly agree. It's a, Jane, that's a very good distinction. It's, it's an important one. I think this claim that Netanyahu has relied on, that Iran is, and you, he repeats it over and over again, Iran is an existential threat uh, to Israel, is partly very much a distraction to keep the focus on why Israel needs more military aid, you know, our $3.2 billion a year in military aid every year, every year, every year to Israel. Uh, that has everything to do with Iran. The refusal of the U.S. or any other country or group of countries around the world to deal with Israel's nuclear weapons is tied to Iran. Because if you look at what Iran represents, it doesn't represent an existential threat to Israel by any stretch of the imagination. 
What it does threaten is Israel's nuclear, what, it, what a, a, I'm talking about, if they ever got a nuclear uh, capacity. Now, you know, there's all kinds of political problems why nuclear capacity in Iran would not turn into a nuclear weapon because of a lot of internal political pressures. But what it would do is threaten the nuclear monopoly that Israel holds in the region. Right now, Israel is the only nuclear power in the region. And that gives it enormous power to threaten every other country, every other group of countries anywhere in the neighborhood. So I think that the threat against Iran is not entirely uh, a distraction. I, I'm not sure I would put numbers on it, but maybe it's 70-30, maybe 60-40, something like that. It's mostly a distraction, but there's a big part of it that if they could get a guarantee of U.S. backing, it wouldn't be so bad to take out uh, what they consider Iran's nuclear capacity for its its nuclear power project that does exist, uh, because that would consolidate Israel's uh, uh, nuclear monopoly that they've relied on for so long, and I think they want to continue doing that. But your point is a very important one, Jane, that, that it is much about uh, a, a distraction to legitimate its aggression for in, in seizing Palestinian land. So I want to follow up on your comments around uh, Kerry, Kerry's involvement in the negotiations in Israel-Palestine, uh, describing them as insanity. Um, so I'm wondering, like here in Eugene, we have a project called the Al-Nakbar Project, Awareness Project. And they uh, promote a alternative one-state model with the right of return. So I'm kind of wondering, uh, given your comments about not repeating uh, ins insanity, given your comments about not repeating insanity over and over again, or the same thing over and over again, uh, what do you think are the solutions in that region? Mm -hmm. You know, I think that um, it won't surprise you to know I have an opinion about the, the um, no, that's not that funny, uh, about the one state, two state debate. But I think what's actually more important is to recognize that I don't think that's our call. I think that what's important for us is to fight for rights, for human rights as the basis for any solution. Now, I could imagine a two state solution or a one state solution in which human rights were, ex were, were respected, that it was based on human rights. A two-state solution that included full Palestinian self-determination in all of the West Bank, all of Gaza, and all of East Jerusalem, meaning a complete end to the occupation, and the right of return to wherever people were from, whether they were from parts of the West Bank or from what is now Israel, they still have the right to return to their homes, all of those rights being respected, uh, and equality, because that's the other key factor. Human rights, international law, and equality. You could base a two-state solution on that, but that's not the two-state solution that's on anyone's agenda. You could base a one-state solution on that, where every person has one vote, equality for all in one state, I think you could imagine either of those. But at the end of the day, it's the people who live there, <coughs> Palestinians and Israelis, who are going to have to make those arrangements. For us, for those of us who are not Palestinian or Israeli, it's not our call, one state, two state, red state, blue state. Our call, I think, needs to be for human rights, international law, and <coughs> equality for all. That's the basis. Then the arrangements are for the people who live there. For us, it's about our government, which right now is enabling the violation of international laws, the inequality instead of equality, and a, com a complete violation of human rights. That's what we have to challenge. So we have to fight for the right of return. We have to fight for an end to occupation. We have to fight for an end to the second class citizenship of Palestinians inside Israel. Those happen to be the basic three arenas of the boycott divestment sanctions movement as well. The, you know, boycotts are not designed to be forever. It's to push Israel to stop those three kinds of violations. I think our work needs to be the same, whether it's stopping military aid, whether it's supporting BDS, but it needs to be based on rights, 
not on the final arrangements. Yes. So I'm going to push you on one one different topic, just to give you one more chance. You um, you suggested a few ideas about Syria, and uh, I have pondered Syria a lot from many angles. And I see, I agree that you should bring Iran into diplomacy over Syria, but I don't see the budding of any solution to Syria happening. Do you have any more hope? Do you have any ideas on? ways to proceed because people ask me for ideas and I I don't see anything happening or coming along or ideas for anything but bad answers there. Thank you. Yeah, I, I wish I had some optimism about Syria. In the short term and in the medium term, I'm afraid I don't. I think that we have to understand that there are at least six separate wars being fought in Syria right now. Only one of them is the war between the Syrian regime and a large part of its population. All of those wars are being fought to the last Syrian, but it is not in the interest of Syrians that they're being fought. There's a regional power war that's largely between Saudi Arabia and Iran with others backing them on each side. There's a sectarian war between Sunni and Shia that's being fought. There's a war between the US and Russia over air air bases, uh, sorry, over naval bases and sea lanes. You know, there's a host of these wars. There's the war between the U.S. and Israel versus Iran over the nuclear policy. There's a war within the opposition between secular and Islamist forces and increasingly within the Islamist forces. All of these wars are being fought to the last Syrian. So the Syrians are paying the price and they are not their wars. They will not win if anybody wins these wars. Death is who's winning. I think that our call needs to be first for diplomacy, still, for the Geneva II talks to be reconvened, still, but they must be linked to an arms embargo. I don't think that's going to happen right away, but I think we've got to put that issue on the table because, frankly, at the end of the day, however good your diplomacy is, if you have people on both sides that are not committed to the diplomacy, which you do, you know, on both sides, those that are at the table don't seem to really represent anybody inside that it's doing the fighting. I, maybe the government officials are a little closer to those in power, but not necessarily. And certainly the uh, opposition forces that are there do not seem to be uh, able to hold to account the, the fighters on the ground. If you have forces outside, whether it's the U.S. and its allies in Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Turkey, Jordan, or whether you see the government in Syria and its allies in, in Russia and Iran, Iraq, whoever, if they're all sending more arms, regardless of the diplomacy, the diplomacy is not going to work. So we have to add to the call for diplomacy a call for an arms embargo. And as I say, I don't think it's going to happen right away, but I think it's got to be on the agenda. It's got to start to be part of the language of the international uh, consideration about what to do about Syria. And the other thing is about the refugees. The refugee crisis is now the biggest refugee crisis in the world and the most urgent. The US has put in a fair amount of money, about $350 million so far. That's more than everybody else, as is appropriate, given that the US part share of the world's economy is more than everybody else. It's not nearly enough. It's not nearly what the US owes given the role of the U.S. in arming this region so gratuitously for so many years. We need to fight for much more money going through the U.N. and to the Red Cross uh, to, for refugees and IDPs both within Syria and in the surrounding region, and at least symbolically, because I don't think there's too many Syrians who would want to take advantage of it, but at least symbolically in this country, we need to fight against the kind of racist attack that refuses to allow Syrians to find refuge in our country. The notion that Syrians can only be given refuge over there is simply not acceptable. We saw that in Iraq, in our war, when Iraqis, including those who had fought with the US forces and were in terrible danger as a result, even they could not get visas. Some of them got them after years, but in the first several years of the Iraq war, 
when when Sweden, for example, was bringing in something like 30,000 refugees a year, the U.S. was bringing in 100, 200 one year. It was criminal, the denial of rights, of our obligations to take care of refugees. We should be allowing Syrian refugees to find refuge here. As I say, I don't imagine very many are going to want to leave the region, but any that do should be allowed to find refuge here. It's criminal that that's not allowed. Phyllis, I've been trying to figure out how to formulate this question for a couple of days, and the question revolves around this idea of American exceptionalism and how we seem to be often at the root of much of the unrest that happens in the world, whether it's as a result of uh, military intervention or uh, other types of covert intervention that destabilize the area and then seemingly when we go back in, uh, whether it's uh, through military intervention or diplomacy, we're still talking about U.S. interest in the outcomes. So, for example, uh, just in the last couple of days, the news around Ukraine uh, has been, you know, villainizing Putin, but there's been very little said about the involvement of the United States. Uh, you know, the uh, U.S. Assistant Secretary of State Victoria Newland's comments that were published a couple of weeks ago, or the role of USAID or the National Endowment of Democracy in actually uh, trying to foment the uh, change in government in the Ukraine. So I'm, I'm wondering about how we move not just from war to diplomacy, but from diplomacy to a change in the way the U.S. projects itself in the world. It's a really important question and a very difficult one. Uh, some of it has to do with our responsibility as people, as civil society, as social movements. What we demand, what we demand of our government, wh how we define what diplomacy looks like, what citizens' diplomacy looks like, uh, building those ties over, under, and through uh, the, the official diplomatic and military efforts, people-to-people -people relations that we have to build. A lot of it has to do with building a kind of internationalism in this country that recognizes international law as something that we are subject to as well as something that our government uses against other countries. You know, this idea that we go to war against countries for their violations of international law while we believe ourselves to be not accountable to it at all. We have to fight for that in, in our own country. It has to do with how we teach young people to, to think about our country. It has to do with challenging the kind of uh, isolationism of huge parts of the libertarian movement and the Tea Party movement and half of Congress. I mean, I think we're a little better now than we were in the late 80s when there was a period uh, I was working at the UN at the time as a journalist, and it was at the I was I was writing about U.S. domination of the UN and the the history of that and how it undermined the UN and had historically for so long. And one of the great examples was how proud some members of Congress were for so long that they had never had a passport, that they had never left the United States. That was a a, a great point of pride that they would never go anywhere but the United States. And it's like, really, you're gonna be proud of that? And if we allow children to grow up thinking that that's something to be proud of, we have a serious problem on our hands. So this notion of American exceptionalism needs to be challenged, you know, because it's based on power. It's not based on any commitment to equality, to human rights, to all the things that we claim are our birthright. If we want to say that they're our birthright and we think we're going to be able to claim them when the rest of the world is denied them, we're living in a dream world. Given the, the question of climate by itself, the, the impact of climate on a global scale is going to create climate refugees, climate wars. And if we believe we can just sort of stand back and watch while it affects the rest of the world and somehow it's not going to affect us, we're living in a dream world. So it's even about even if we don't care, and we shouldn't care very much because it's already well protected, but even if we cared only about U.S. interests, we would care a lot about internationalism because without it, we won't survive. But our obligation is to teach that, to challenge the notion 
that somehow this country is not only so uh, exceptional, but is the moral beacon, the, the shining city on a hill. It hasn't been ever a shining city on a hill. You know, it was always a shining settlement above the village, much as the Israelis are now. You know, if you look at the, at the history of westward expansion and, and manifest destiny, those were terms that were used to justify genocide. Slavery was justified in the name of, of bringing Christianity to the benighted heathen. You know, we, we have to challenge these things on their face. We have to challenge American exceptionalism. We have to challenge this notion that we are somehow the moral nation uh, while everyone else isn't. And that's not going to be easy. That's not going to be easy. It means everything we do, we can't ever focus only on the immediate. When we fight to prevent military strikes against Syria, it has to be in the context of because the United States also doesn't have the right to attack another country, even if we think that it's going to help somehow. We don't have the right to do that without international law approving it, and international law doesn't approve it. So we need to keep that linkage as a serious component of what we do. So we're going to take some questions from the audience. Uh, again, we'll make this clear that we need to make them questions, not long statements. So uh, I'll be coming to you. Uh, we'll raise your hand, and I'll bring the mic to you. Hi, fellas. This is Jack Dresser. I'm the co-director of the aforementioned Al Nakba Awareness Project. So I'd like to speak for ourselves rather than having Stan do it. Actually, we, we do support uh, international law and human rights, period. And we don't insist on uh, promoting a one-state solution, but it seemed the most likely uh, model that would bring that about. I certainly thank you for your heavy dose of realism. You're repeating the same things that we've been pre preaching here for several years, uh, which have been taboo in Eugene, Oregon, and which have been largely boycotted. And so it's really good to hear uh, an authoritative voice supporting that. Now, I have a couple of questions. One is about the, the so-called peace process or the negotiations going on right now. Um, and you, you mentioned, of course, the importance of inclusion. And when it comes to the Palestinian representation in either the Oslo process or what's going on now, uh, this is exclusively, quote, negotiated with Fatah, which is an unelected... Uh, representative of Palestine that excludes the diaspora, it excludes most of the refugees, it excludes Hamas, uh, it excludes the uh, Palestinian citizens of Israel, which as you note are discriminated against by over 50 laws within Israel. So um, what's the solution to that? How do, we, how do we get all of Palestine represented in the negotiations? Yeah, it's a really important question, um, the, the question comes back to the role of the PLO. The PLO is supposed to be the negotiating partner. One of the problems is that, that President Mahmoud Abbas, of the, the president of the Palestinian Authority, is also the chairman of the PLO. Uh, ideally, if this was being recognized as a PLO initiative rather than a PA initiative, he would be addressed in international fora as Mr. Chairman, not Mr. President which is his name, his, his title, only in the context of uh, the, 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 uh, the PA, the, the Palestinian Authority, which, as you say, only reflects inside the occupied territories and not even all of that, because Gaza is excluded, etc. So it's a huge problem. And the, the rebuilding of the PLO, the unification process that is still struggling to take hold uh, between the two parts of the governing structures in the occupied territory is perhaps a first start. It's not the end game, because as you say, the, the refugees are still not included. They are part of the PLO. Uh, the PLO factions are not what, what they once were. Uh, they haven't been for 20 years or more. Uh, Hamas was never a member of the PLO and has indicated it doesn't necessarily want to join the PLO. Uh, Hamas has given the PA the right to, uh, sorry, the PLO 
the right to conduct diplomacy and has said that they reserve their right to their opinions about it later. Um, but it's a very messy thing when you have a people that has been largely disenfranchised. Uh, it's not unusual to find that the negotiators for them are not necessarily accountable to the majority of the population. And that's the situation that we have here. It's not something that we can impose or determine from outside. That's something that has to come from within the Palestinian community. And there are efforts within the diaspora, inside the OPT, the occupied territory, uh, and inside Israel among Palestinians there to reclaim some of that. But it's going to be a very long struggle. It's a very, very hard thing. Uh, it's like talking about the PA as if it was a real government rather than a derivative authority whose whose power is completely limited by an outside occupying force. Hi, uh, thank you so much for staying up a little extra late for us folks on the left coast. Um, my name is Barclay, and I was thrilled that you mentioned, at least in passing, the power of citizen diplomacy. And as you know, we're, we're obviously Skyping, and, it and all these new social media tools that are at our fingertips that we're still trying to understand and grapple with. Have you seen on the landscape, in all of these big, heavy, heavy issues, any positive effect of citizens like you and me and just regular everyday folks changing the dialogue? And then the other part would be in the future, what do you see, what would you recommend that citizens could do to, in to meet Palestinians, to meet Israelis, to meet Syrians to, you know, to, to just bit by bit get to understand each other a little bit better? Yeah, I mean, I think that particularly in war zones like Syria or in occupied areas like Palestine, particularly Gaza right now, which is really closed off, really isolated in a very powerful, profound way, that was the consequence, the, 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 the most important uh, lesson that the Israelis were teaching was not the lesson to Medea Benjamin when they dislocate. Uh, sorry, when the Egyptians dislocated her arm. It was a message to everybody who wanted to go to Gaza to say, no, Gaza is to remain isolated, at least for now. For the Israelis, Gaza is to remain isolated forever, as far as they're concerned. So this is a huge challenge. Social media can play a huge role in that. Uh, you know, this is a, an era when even in very impoverished communities, in, in crowded refugee camps, when there's a shortage of electricity. At the moment when the electricity comes on for a couple of hours, the first thing people do is go to charge up their cell phones, charge their computers so that they can send information so they can get out into the world. They can send emails, they can get on Facebook, they can send their YouTubes. Now, all of that is really important. It's a way of engaging. This is something the Palestinians did very early on, before what we now consider social media. There were campaigns involving kids in refugee camps in the West Bank. There was the, in the Dehesha camp, for example, outside of Bethlehem, the, the youth program there back in the 90s, back in the mid-90s, began a program with one of the refugee camps in, uh, uh, in, in Lebanon to engage the kids in producing videos that they would exchange with each other. It wasn't so easy then, but they still did it. And they, they talked through beginning email. That was in the very early days of email. Uh, and this has continued, this kind of exchange among Palestinians, for instance, which is really important because they're so isolated from each other. We have it easier. We have Skype, we have computers, we have cell phones. I don't have to use half of it, but they're there and there's other young people do. Uh, and I think it is very important. They have played a huge role in these struggles. If we look at the Operation Cast Lead in Gaza, the, the, uh, the, the three-week war in 2008-2009, one of the first things the Israelis did was try and keep out the international press. But they found that they couldn't because for the first time, the international press, one, was already living there. Al Jazeera had people there. The New York Times had a young Gazan <laughs> reporter who was living in Gaza. And they had cell phones. They had access to computers to get information out. So there was no way to have the eyes of the world not on it. Now, the other side of that, and we're seeing that certainly in Syria, is that it's being misused on all sides. There's claims being made that can't be, can't be uh, determined who's doing what. There's, there's claims about uh, atrocities being committed that turn out to actually not even be happening in Syria at all. There's been 
huge problems around that. So the ease of social media presents new challenges for how we determine what's accurate as well. So there's a lot of, of challenges, but certainly the opportunity to engage with people through social media is, is an important first step uh, for people to, to learn to see things through other eyes. Phyllis, um, thank you very much for your incisive uh, contribution. I'd like to offer maybe a little left coast uh, repost. In, in fact, my name's Fergus. In fact, the American system has never worked in the modern era as anything but an empire. The American system failed as a national system at the end of the 19th century and became an empire very consciously. I, I've been reading William Appleman Williams lately, but I, I, I find it to be very convincing. And so along the uh, line of the Einsteinian uh, warning, is it a coincidence that Libya, Syria, Somalia, Ukraine find their financial systems outside the reach of the Bank of International Settlements? And Iran. And Iran. You know, I would say only that I think that uh, the U.S. empire system began before that time. I think that from the beginning of European settlement on this continent, there was an imperial drive to conquer, to conquer borders, to conquer the West, to conquer more land, to conquer peoples. Uh, and it has been an imperial system, I think, from the beginning. So I would say that that's uh, an even longer uh, process than what you say. I don't think it's about coincidences. I don't think it's about conspiracies. I think that there has been uh, an effort to by the U.S., certainly since the end of the Cold War, to consolidate uh, territory and resources, particularly resources, that were once out of reach to get access to those resources and to get control of those resources. And that has to do with banking and finance arrangements. It has to do with pipelines. It has to do with a whole lot of things. Um, so, yeah, I think that the, the question of where these crises emerge is rarely in places where there are no significant uh, uh, resources that are of concern, whether it's water, whether it's oil, whether it's coltan. Uh, so yeah, the banking system reflects the interests of powerful political and economic interests in the most powerful countries. In the case of, I mean, I'm no expert on, on uh, uh, Ukraine, which is partly why I didn't talk about it very much. If I'm learning as I go. One of the things I'm learning is that uh, the, the EU seems to have, in this case, significantly more options right now than the U.S. does. Uh, the U.S. is trying, and they certainly played a role through funding uh, parts of the opposition, including some of the, the, the most extreme elements, the extreme fascist elements within the opposition. Uh, I assume that funding was done through things like USAID and NED, because that's their usual method. Uh, but I think that what's important here is that we also don't um, be reductionist. People in Ukraine also have some agency here. They are not simply pawns in the hands of the United States. The same is true whether we're talking about Venezuela or Palestine or uh, Myanmar or anywhere else. It's always a combination of pressures from outside and internal pressures as well. And we have to be, I think, careful not to reduce everything to this is simply what the U.S. is wanting to do, and that's the only factor that, that comes into play. Hi. Um, my name is Jenny, and I'm curious if you see a candidate in the coming presidential election that we could put our energy behind? Well, luckily, I work for a 501c3 nonprofit, and we're not allowed to. <laughs> <laughs> That's Good very way. easy. I, the, my answer is no, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Ask me personally when you see me on the street. I might have an opinion, but right now, I probably would have the same opinion. Hi, my name's Dan. 
I wonder if you have any. Um, I wonder if you have any uh, sense of the impact of the amazing movie that was uh, shown about a year ago, I guess, of the six Israeli, the most recent Israeli security heads. The gatekeepers. Yeah, the gatekeepers on Israel. Mm. You know, it's And funny. secondly, on the United States. Yeah, I think the the impact is probably greater in the United States. The press and the discourse in Israel, not the political opinions so much, but the political debate is far freer in Israel than it is here on the question of Israel. Uh, if you read Haaretz, as I do pretty regularly, uh, you see a much wider range of opinion on a regular basis. You know, the notion that somebody like Amir Haas or Gideon Levy have you know a, a several several write several days a week in Haaretz, which is essentially like the New York Times of Israel, <clears throat> is a is a pretty astonishing thing if you compare it to our press here. Uh, so I think it was probably less uh, shocking for Israelis. We should note that this was all formers. None of these were were current. Uh, uh, leaders of the of the military and intelligence agencies that they had led earlier. They were all formers. Uh, and it's quite traditional in Israel that formers come out against the policies that they massively defended when they were current. Um, so, yeah, I think it was probably much more important here. I would say that I think the film Five Broken Cameras, uh, which was also, you know, nominated for an Academy Award, as was the great film Omar, which those of you who have the chance to see it do so. It didn't win, but boy, it should have. Fantastic film. Um, sorry, that's my little plug. But uh, Five Broken Cameras, which was the, a Palestinian film, not an Israeli film, uh, I think in many ways had an even greater impact, perhaps both in Israel as well as certainly in the United States, because it's for those who are familiar with what occupation actually looks like on the ground, it's a powerful, evocative uh, presentation of it. But for those who either willfully or otherwise really don't know what occupation looks like, it's shocking. It's absolutely shocking. And I think that impact is ultimately going to be far greater. <clears throat> Any other people want to ask a question? Well, then let's thank Phyllis Bennis for taking the time to be with us. Thank you very much, Phyllis. Thank you. Good night. Online. Learn. Unlearn. Relearn.